beautiful hey we're live um jim and today uh, i'm having uh, a special guest um musician uh contrabassoonist with the pittsburgh symphony since 2001 and uh, yeah and i am chingju i've been hosting this uh live interview you saw live conversation now it's becoming live chat <laughs> with people from all walks of life, uh, musicians, uh, filmmakers, politicians, and uh, people who ha have voices, want to talk about their crafts. And thank you, Jim and uh, Rogers. And I met Jim actually this year in Pittsburgh. So do you remember how we met? Well, I, what I remember is that um... You and my wife were talking after a concert, and um, you came up and introduced yourself and mentioned that you had a son who was playing viola with us. And I believe that was his trial week. I mean, he hadn't officially joined the orchestra yet, if I remember correctly. But since then, um, your, your son, Sean, and I have spent a lot of time hanging out together on tour and talking together on the job, so to speak. And it's been a wonderful time, but I, I remember that, that we, um, you and I, seemed to hit it off right away. And then we got to spend some time in Europe when you came brave to travel all by yourself to come overseas to be with your son, which was, I think, you know, a very, very wonderful thing to do. It was very nice to see you then. I'm sure he was very happy to see you then. I remember spending time in Wiesbaden and in Cologne and um, right at the end of our tour, it was, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, yeah, my, my apologies to the bassoonists in the audience right now. <laughs> I was trying to play a little bit of the Mozart concerto and I went a little off track, so to speak, trying to, so for, for, improvising. Forgive, the, for, forgive the loose interpretation of the, uh, <laughs> the, the second movement of Mozart's um, wonderful bassoon concerto. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yes, so uh, Jim, not very many people know knows your instrument, you know, so give us a little spiel of what is a contrabassoon compared to bassoon? Well, this instrument that I'm playing, that I started playing, is, is the bassoon. And um, you can see it's, you know, kind of... <laughs> it's so long. Yeah. 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 And then it, it kind of ends at the top there. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uses, it uses a reed, a special kind of reed. It's actually two pieces of cane tied together, which make it a double reed. And there are several instruments in the double reed family in the orchestra. There's the oboe. And then mm -hmm. when you go down in other versions of the oboe that are used in the orchestra, there's the an instrument called the oboe d'amour. Mm. And it's used in it's used uh, to great effect um, in one piece that we play a lot, bolero. Oboe d'amour has a solo in bolero. And then there's the English horn, which is neither English nor a horn, but it's a larger <laughs> version of the oboe. And it has a, a curved metal mouthpiece coming out, which is called a vocal. The reed fits over the end of it. And then... Underneath that are two very special instruments, which I'll talk about later. And then you get into the bassoon family, which the bassoon there, as you saw. And then if I can fit it into screen, we have the contra bassoon. And so mm. you can see the contra bassoon. It's got a metal bell mm. all the way down to the bottom, sits on a floor peg. Wow. Is and it a one octave lower? Or two yep. octave lower. It's one octave lower than the okay. than the, the bassoon. I see. And it, it uses also a, a big version of a double reed. And uh -huh. 
I don't know if the microphone will pick up the low sounds, but I'll give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to hear. Yeah, when you get really low, it doesn't uh, doesn't I guess uh, project right. Well, it, it's it's the the frequencies are so low at that point that some microphones have a tough time picking it up, and I my my microphone must not be strong enough to be able to pick it up. But it does um, use the very very lowest notes in in the orchestra. And the contrabassoon and the double bass share the very lowest notes. Mm. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to play. You literally feel the vibrations in your head when you're playing. Mm. And I play both instruments in the orchestra. My position is principal contrabassoonist which means the contrabassoonist. And <laughs> it's not like you also, have a section. A section yeah, of there's no country. section of contrabassoonist. We, <laughs> we, we don't often need more than one. We are doing mm -hmm. a piece later in the season, a very famous piece, probably one of the most famous pieces of classical music, the Le Sacre du Printemps, The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. That calls for two contrabassoons. So it's one of the few pieces that are done um, standardly that require more than one contrabassoon. And mm. it's a, it's a lot it's a lot of fun to have more than one because I I enjoy being the only one but I also get a little lonely sometimes, so you cannot screw up. No <laughs> no 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 one no one has the uh, yeah no no one else knows what I'm supposed to be playing. So that's <laughs> this is this is the yeah this is my contrabassoon uh -huh. and you can see it's it's kind of a it's kind of big and yeah it doesn't have any holes the bassoon has a few holes but this is all keys mm. so. It's kind of nice. You can space everything out just exactly as you want. But that's so, my yeah. So that's my which, title. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Which melody is is uh, instrument? Yeah, that's the that's the one that that's the from the Rite of Spring, uh -huh. and that's the high bassoon. So okay, I'll see if I can try to play that. Okay. Everyone, every, all the bassoon players are going. No, no, no! Don't do it. <laughs> Nice, nice. Is that, that is it like an audition excerpts must? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> even even on a contrabassoon audition, you'll be asked to play that. Oh my goodness! Because it's 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 a very it's very difficult. Um, to pull off just right, there's a lot, and also it's it's the opening of one of the most famous pieces of classical music ever written, and so it it has quite a history. It has quite a bit of weight to it, mm. even even in addition to the fact that it's difficult to to play just right. Mm. So it has it has a lot going for it. It's and and I I've enjoyed it. For for me, it was a very important piece. My very first bassoon teacher was playing examples of what the bassoon would sound like, and mm. he played that piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I had no idea it could go that high. And it was he showed me the notes so I can play them. This was really great. And then I said, can we listen to the rest of it? And it blew my mind to hear that when I was, you know, 12 years old. And it, it really it made such a such a huge impression. And it, it, it remains my favorite piece, I think, of all time, simply because of my history with it and its history and just my fondness of the opening, all kinds of things. Um, I know people always, it's very, it's a very difficult question to ask when people ask that, what's your favorite piece? And really, honestly, it, for me, it's whatever I'm listening to. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I love everything. I love all music, but that, that piece has such, such a history, such a unique place in bassoon history and music history. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to, to really dwell on. And I'm glad yeah. that we play it every few years. Like as I said, we're going to be playing it later this season, so I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I love that piece. I love that piece. Um, you know, the Stravinsky. Um, now let's rewind a little bit. Um, string players, a lot of them starting <laughs> starting to play when they're like five years old. Like Sean started five years old. And tell us a little bit, like when did you start? And is 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 your family are musicians? How did you become a bassoonist there's the three questions <laughs> so well, yeah tell us how how did you start to play music well when i when i was about 10 years old i started on the clarinet and my brother started on the violin and you're right I, as it's 
it was not encouraged at that time to start very young on an instrument. These days you can, these days it is encouraged, at least in Europe. Um, I know I've been, we were there recently and I talked to a number of bassoon manufacturers and sellers and stuff like that. And they actually make little versions of the bassoon that can be played when you're very young. So the idea of that though, wasn't really around when I was young. So when I was 10 years old, I started playing the clarinet and I really loved it. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. The, um, then I, I went to middle school and in middle school, there were our, uh, our band director had wanted us to try to take up different instruments to try to give more of a balance to the ensemble. There were a lot of clarinets, a lot of flutes, a lot of trumpets. And so before the beginning of the second semester, he, he wrote up on the blackboard different instruments he was hoping we might decide to play. For example, French horn, tenor saxophone, trombone. And there was this instrument that I'd never heard of. B-A-S-S-O-O-N, bass oon. Mm -hmm. I was convinced that it was called bass oon. I envisioned a whole family of oons and that this was the bass version of it. And I said, mm -hmm. I'll play that. It mm -hmm. sounded really cool. I was, I was kind of eager to do something different, something new. And he was of course very happy because very few people volunteer to play this instrument. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So he went and got the case and one of the, just the one piece of the bassoon was bigger than my whole clarinet. And then he put it together and I was literally the same size as the instrument. I, I was not a very tall seventh grader. Mm. And I started playing, I, I had a fingering chart and a reed. I went home and I learned a couple of scales and the next day I was first chair in the band. <laughs> and pretty soon I was playing in the orchestra with, wow. within, a, within a few months. The, the the same bassoon teacher who had introduced me to the Red of Spring, he was playing in a community orchestra and they needed a second bassoon player. And I was nowhere near ready to do this, but we did it anyway. Um, in, in April of 1980, I played my first full orchestra concert, which included Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Wow. The, I remember it, it was the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, Mozart's overture to the abduction from the Seraglio and songs from the Auvergne, by Cantaloupe. That was the mm. program. And when I finished, I, I was so overwhelmed with, with joy at having done it and having experienced, having been a part of that, that then and there I said, this is what I want to do. Mm. And, and I didn't know if I could, I didn't know how I could, I didn't know if it was possible to do this for a living, mm -hmm. but I decided that's what I wanted to do. And then after that, one thing led to another and now I'm here. <laughs> wow. Wow, but my family, amazing. to answer your other question, are not, yeah. not musical. My brother, as I said, played the violin. My parents mm. played instruments when they were in school. But mm -hmm. my father was an organic chemistry professor. Mm. My mother was a special education teacher mm -hmm. at the elementary and middle school level. And mm. my brother also f started to follow in my father's footsteps as a chemistry mm. teacher, eventually became a superintendent of schools in Claremont, California. And mm. so... Education has always been a huge part of our family, mm -hmm. and which I'm very thankful for. Learning how to be an educator is a big part of being a musician, teaching right. and all that sort of thing. But, but, but there was no, no, as far as I know, no history of anyone doing what I'm doing for a living. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of thrilling to, to be kind of blazing a trail yeah. in a way using, using the, um, you know, a rather unique instrument to do so. And I've been it's very a... fortunate to have had some very good teachers, some very good training, some very good role models, play in some very fine orchestras. And this is my 22nd year in the Pittsburgh Symphony. Wow. And yeah. Very, very happy. Very grateful to be here. You know, it's, it's a very, yeah. You know, it's, I, I'm a, I, I was a professional orchestra musician. It's very difficult for a wind player uh, to, to get a job because you only have usually one or two positions in the orchestra, right? For string players, a viola, you know, have a six or 12 violas, if, uh, depending on the budget. So you have played like so many orchestra before you get into Pittsburgh, like Jacksonville, right? You were the uh, associate principal, Flor uh, like a well, second person, it was a Houston. No, no, that's a huge jump, right? Mm -hmm. Color. Uh, and, and so... Yeah, that, so uh, I wanted to thank, uh, hold on one second, I want to thank some people in the audience. Uh, my my friend, um, friends, uh, Louis, 
and he has a uh, website. He has a channel on a uh, YouTube channel, teach people how to use a tech. So tech for your needs. You, can you see the people on the right hand side right now on your phone? Okay. I, yeah. I, I'm this is sorry. tiny. No. It's a tiny. Yeah. So um, on my uh, end, I can see it. And Shark Tech is my friend, Mark. He said earlier, a one read instrument is hard enough to master. I am a former alto sax uh, player. I cannot imagine playing the instrument with two reeds. So, so yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, the difference between one and two. Like I'm a string player. I have no idea. Well, one, uh, a, what they call a single reed instrument, basically you have a, a single reed that vibrates and it's placed against a mouthpiece and it vibrates against the mouthpiece. And inside the mouthpiece, there's a cavity which allows the reed to resonate a certain way. And there are all these different facets that, um, that allow that to happen properly. Oh, we have a guest. Oh. <laughs> Hello, she, just, Kiki. she decided to say hello. Hello, so wave cute. to the audience. Hi, hi. She's she's drawn to the cane. See these yeah. these guys love to eat my cane. Yeah. Oh. I learned that early on that they're very fond of, <laughs> they're of, of helpful. reeds, and, and so she <laughs> yeah. she could smell the reed sitting there on the table, and so she jumped up to try to get it. Yeah, that's um, a vegetable, you know. <laughs> It is. It is. You can you can you can steam it and eat it. It's delicious. So so the, the difference, though, you have the single read against the mouthpiece and it, it uses the mouthpiece cavity to to vibrate and to resonate. And the difference between that is the double read is that in, with the double read, you have two pieces of wood, one against the other, and they vibrate on their own when you blow through them. So so that and and depending on how you craft it and for what instrument it is. But that's basically the principle of it is that they're vibrating against each other. And you're controlling how the air goes through and you're controlling how much you, you um, apply pressure from, from either side to get the and, and the airflow and everything like that makes the reed work a certain way. And there are a million different ways to scrape the reed to get it to play the way you want. And there are many different ways to construct the reed to get it to play the way you want as well. The, um, but that's the, that's the main difference. Mm -hmm. And also what, what are called single reed instruments, the saxophone, the clarinet, typically they don't make their own reeds um, because it, it really isn't very cost effective. I know, I know people who have made their own reeds and they've done a very good job of it, but typically most people purchase them or have them sent to them and they, they, work, they work on them and finish them themselves. But many professional double reed players, I would say most, make their own reeds. And that's kind of a fascinating process. It, it involves, um, basically, I, I have a, a, a sort of a raw reed here, I guess you could say. So this is, this is basically a, a, a tube of bamboo. It's, it's mm. from a species called Arundo donax. Oh, the string, like, string, as, string teachers will bend your head with. Yes, yes, you could do that. <laughs> Can you hear it resonating? <laughs> yeah, yes. it's quite resonant. <laughs> yeah. But this is this is what this is what um I don't know if I, if I'm holding it right. Mm. You can see it. Yeah, yeah, double read. Yeah, this is this is what it this is what a rondo donax looks like in the wild. Mm. Looks like a weed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it basically a big a big piece of grass, mm. and um it's quite invasive actually. I know in sub in central California there was a multi million dollar campaign to try to eradicate this stuff because it it's it's incredibly invasive incredibly strong it requires a great deal of water mm. but it's when it's harvested when you actually grow it in good soil and do nice things with it it produces a beautiful rich golden uh tone once it's harvested mm -hmm. and there's a there's a whole process to doing that so it really depends at what point you decide you're going to start making your read you can you can either you can either I know I have friends who actually go out and cut it down themselves, and it's pretty amazing. They know how to do that. They know how to pick the right diameter. They know how to how to cure it. How to make sure that it's going to work, and then I just have it sent to me in sections like this. So what I would do, you can see that this is kind of a hollow tube. I see. Mm. I would split this hollow tube a certain way mm. so that I can get symmetrical curves. And then I would put it in a kind of a precision planer 
mm. which would gouge out the inside of it, making it thin enough. Mm. I have a piece of, of cane of gouge cane here. So you can see, I don't know if you can see the thinness right. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Versus this, it's which is curved. very thick. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to orient with the camera. And yeah. um so, can you so use then, can you use both side because it's curved this way, not like all the way. So can oh, you yeah, use yeah, this, this so both you use, side? You 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 end up taking this and putting it in something like this. This is called a shaper. Mm. You put it inside that and you shape it so that it becomes that that shape. Mm. Uh, and then you put it on a machine that's called a profiler. And this is a very fancy machine. Wow. Wow, look at that. Basically, you put look. you put it on. Looks like a typewriter. <laughs> yeah, it's a typewriter. It goes click that. <laughs> yeah. But you put it here, and this there's a blade right here. I see. Which enables you, and then over here, there's a pattern. I see. So what this does is it reproduces that pattern onto the cane. And then you have you have a piece of cane which which has been gouged out, which has been shaped, and then which has been profiled. Mm. And from that, you take that piece of cane, and you fold it over, and you put a little forming mandrel inside of it so that it creates a tube on the on on the bottom. And then you put wires around it, you put string around it, and then voila, you have a reed. You make one at a time, or you make two at a time, or more. Well, like can you, you can multiply? do them in different stages. Okay. So, so I can I can split a bunch of tubes, and then I can gouge a bunch of pieces, and then I can shape a bunch of pieces. It, it's um, it's better to do to do multiple reads the different stages. So, once once they're in the finished stage, then I I work on them one at a time. And you can do that. You can either use a file or you can use a scraping knife, all kinds of different ways of getting it to be um, the way you want it to be. And there are lots and lots of really nice, neat videos that are on YouTube that will that will tell you how to put a bassoon read together. If, if wow. you just, you know, go on YouTube and, and say construct a bassoon read, it'll it, there are a lot of videos that will take you through the different stages of it. And it, yeah, different it's people have different methods. It's very it's very fascinating. And I'm always I'm always going on and, and checking them out because I, I'm eager to learn, e even after all this time, I'm eager to learn if there's some step that will make things easier, that will make things cleaner, that will make things better. Yeah. So even even though I've made literally thousands of reads, um, I, I'm, I'm always eager to learn more. So I, I and I, I confer with my colleagues, both international and national about what they like to do. And we, we all kind of like to help each other out because it's, it's, it's not an exact science. It's very, yeah. At, at the end of the day, we have this this piece of piece of wood that we're working with, and no two pieces are alike. Yeah. So every reed is going to have its own unique character, and that's part of the excitement too. I think is is the discovery. Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat. But I make my own reeds for bassoon and for contrabassoon. And also, the other instrument makes uh, is it all double reed people like oboe player, mm -hmm. oboe players, and bassoon players. Uh, any other uh, double reed? Uh, players gotta make their own reeds. Well, oboe players who also play English horn, they make mm -hmm. their own reeds. Right. And then oboe players who play oboe d'amour, they make their own reeds. Bassoon mm -hmm. players who play contra bassoon, they make their own reeds. Mm -hmm. The um, there are other instruments that are less that are not so standard in the orchestra that use double reeds. For example, bagpipes use double mm -hmm. reeds. Ah. Oh. And oh. and they're they're all there's a whole slew of different kinds of uh, bagpipes that come from different countries and different backgrounds. And most mm -hmm. of them for the the what's called the chanter, the part that you actually finger mm -hmm. and play, that's that usually has a double reed inside of it. And one of the differences is that we put the, the reed in our mouth and we adjust it by playing it. Bagpipes don't. It's inside the chanter and the bag forces air through it. So you don't have as much control over the volume and the subtlety and that sort of thing. It basically mm. is just very loud. <laughs> right, right. So um, now at the very beginning, uh, at at what stage people, uh, students start to make their own reads? Because it seems like it's an art itself. If you make bad read, you'll sound not very good, right? <laughs> right <laughs> and, and sometimes right. you just have to throw it away and then redo it like oh yeah another question is how long does it take to make a really good read from beginning to the end well 
I, I remember timing the the stages one time because as as I as I mentioned before, we don't really you know we we do we do each each stage um, multiple pieces of cane in each stage. But I remember timing like how long it took me to split one piece and gouge one piece and profile one piece. And for me, from beginning to end to get a read it takes about forty five minutes. Oh, that's to, very quick. Well, I mean, yeah, because I've I've gotten you know not so Good not so that. bad at it yeah. to get it to the point where it'll actually play, and then the breaking in and all of that stuff that can take a while because you have to you have to let it settle, you have to play it in, not all not all at once at the beginning. You play it a little bit, you let it sit. You play a little more, you let it sit. That kind of thing, and then you adjust it with the knife or the file. That can take time. That can take a while. Um, yeah. The big the bigger the read, the longer that can take. But the longer it can last, my mm -hmm. contrabassoon reads take a long time to break in, but they can last a while. And I, I, I don't want to reveal how long because most oboe players get very angry with me when I tell them <laughs> how long contrabassoon reads can last. Because typically <laughs> oboe reads don't last very long. Oh, I see, I see. So yeah. when when you play on stage, do you ever had a like a like before the stage sounds good? When you're on the stage, all of a sudden it sound like crap. Do you ever run it? <laughs> Do you ever that's run into happened, that? That's happened a few times. I try. I try not to blame the read. I try to blame myself more <laughs> often than not. But 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 you you will have that run into that, especially when you're going on tour, for example, from place to place. You just never know what what to expect, and mm. sometimes you don't get very long to to figure out what the stage is going to feel like. So mm. we always try to have many with us. Mm. Ideally, yeah. we try to have have a um, a container full of you know several at least five or ten or twenty or however many you want and that mm. that way you can you can have different ones for different situations weather um, right sometimes yeah, it, weather it has happened on occasion that the read has i don't want to say betrayed me that i've i again it's 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 it's, uh, it's entirely my fault i'm the one who makes it so yeah. i take the full blame and yeah, occasionally yeah. i've had to work a little bit harder the the idea is that that you you have a you have a read and you have the player and you try to get them to the abilities of each to overlap so comfortably you can play it. If the read is not as good, then you have to work a little harder. Mm. And and hopefully you you don't have something like this. Mm. <laughs> hopefully mm. you have a nice overlap situation. So yeah. the, the goal then is to have a read that that will allow you to do everything that you want to do comfortably. Right. And right. to not have to work as hard as you need to, but also be ready in case the read does change mm -hmm. to be able to overcome that. Very, very fascinating. <laughs> uh, my friend, uh, Shark Fin Tech says, I had no idea that some woodwind players craft their own reads and um, mind blow. And he also said, it's, it's very interesting to me that French horn is a woodwind instrument while, no, no, sorry. English horn is a woodwind instrument while French horn is considered a brass. Well, I, yeah, it, I, yeah, go ahead. It's an, it's an interesting story about that. So the, the, the word for, for English horn is cor anglais. And the reason it's called cor anglais is because back in the old days when, when English horns were, were oboe, long, the long oboes were made, they were actually angled so that you, the, the instrument itself was not straight. It was curved a little bit to facilitate the fingering because it was a very long distance between the holes and the keys were not as easy as they are now. They're, now they have keys that can extend a great deal and make things very easy. You can keep things very close together. But back in the day, it was an angled horn. And so a, a lot of a lot of very, um, I, I don't want to say old um, notation or descriptions for the instruments, they, they simply describe the instrument. For example, the French word for oboe is hautbois, which means high wood. It's a high high wood instrument. And so then the you have the next instrument down, which is an angled horn, so cor anglais. And the word anglais in French can also mean English. So it translated as English horn, horn, English, English horn. Mm. So it it's not it's not a brass instrument at all. It's definitely an oboe in uh, oboe in the oboe family. But it has that same that same kind of connotation, and also the the word for bassoon in German is the word fagot, which in German means bundle of sticks, mm. and um, it's because it came in pieces. Back in back in the old days, it came in one very long piece, 
And now it, it comes or not now, but hundreds of years ago, they just, they made it so that it could come apart and you would put it in a bundle in a, of cloth and put a string around it and it would look like a bundle of sticks. And so that became its name. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. So uh, I want to talk about um, as a symphonic player, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you prepare to a piece you do not know and what are the key things for becoming a very you know accomplished uh, musician as a as a because you are very different you your country bassoonist or bassoonist and you don't always uh, play like a string player always have melodies pretty much or accompaniment you you pretty much are uh, you are a soloist in many parts and how do you prepare a work a, a new piece. Well, yes. the the one one of the things just to kind of stay in 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 shape in general, I guess you could say, is is most of us have a pretty rigorous fundamental daily routine, so that we have command of the instrument. So I'll play scales and arpeggios and etudes and long tones, and I make reeds so that everything can work, and then. So my fundamentals then hopefully <laughs> are very, very strong. And so when we get a new piece, hopefully the piece is comprised of some aspect of these fundamentals. Hopefully it'll have scales, hopefully it'll have arpeggios, hopefully it'll have something recognizable. And hopefully it'll have a metronome marking, hopefully it'll have dynamics, hopefully it'll have everything that we would need to be able to play it on the page. So in theory, it has everything even a new piece contains everything that I've already worked on and mm -hmm. that I've already prepared for. So I begin by trying to isolate the passages that look obviously difficult, you know, <laughs> the ones with all the notes and everything. And I figure out whether I can play it yet. You know, is it, is it too fast for me to play? If it's too fast, then I slow everything way down to a point where I can play it. And then I, from there, work it up. And this can take some time. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's good it's good to make sure that you have this music in advance. And fortunately, with with us and our our situation, we have very very good librarians, and they always make sure that we get the music ahead of time. So it's it's up to us then to go in and get it and to prepare it. If it's a world premiere, if it's never been played before, then we're really on our own as to how it's going to sound. And I a lot of times I'll see if I can get my hands on the score so that I can see what my role is. Because as you mentioned, my role is very rarely melodic. Mine is more supportive. So I want to know where I need to come out and where I should not come out. And it's pretty rare for a contrabassoon to be given a solo moment, but it does happen on occasion. We did mm -hmm. a piece not that long ago by the composer and conductor Esapekka Salonen. The name of the piece was Helix. And it began with this wonderful contrabassoon and piccolo duet wow i know it's very like like that you know but if i hadn't gone and if i'd picked up my part and just looked at it i would have i would have had no idea because it wasn't clearly marked it just looked like there was this very long section so when i got the score i looked at it and went holy smokes it's a duet it's mm. bassoon and contrabassoon and piccolo how cool is that and it yeah. lasted for a, a good long time at the beginning of the piece and then the piece developed and developed based on this melody Mm. So we were given the awesome responsibility of introducing the thematic material. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's something. So, so really just making sure that I'm in shape, making sure fundamentals are there, making sure everything's good, and then being able to get the music well, well in advance to be able to have it prepared. Because mm -hmm. we're, we're not given a lot of rehearsal time when, when, when the time comes. And particularly with contemporary pieces, it, it really depends on the situation, but there, there can be a situation where the contemporary piece is part is not the not the focal part of the program. Mm -hmm. There may be a, a a very big symphony, Tchaikovsky Sixth Symphony, for example, and the contemporary piece may be at the beginning of the program, and it's it's very important piece, but it may not get all of the attention in the mm -hmm. rehearsal. So it's very very important to have that prepared as well as you can. But how I many, love things like that. Yeah, I love how, playing new music. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And how many uh, how many services do you have in general and how many rehearsals for you to prepare one concert, one program? Yeah, that that's a good question because it depends on the on the concert, but if we're talking about our our Grand Classic series for example, we'll have 
four to five rehearsals for that. And then we'll have two to three performances. And sometimes that they may do portions of that for another, another program. And sometimes we'll have our featured soloists for the week participate in something called our 360 program, which basically you're on stage with the musician. It's very, very cool. For pops type programs, we'll have fewer rehearsals, maybe two and maybe three performances. For our children's concert series and our outreach concerts, we typically have one rehearsal and then could be any number of concerts. For, for our school time concerts, we'll do maybe five or six performances stretched out over a couple of weeks. The, the, one, the one series or, or genre of performances we've been doing a lot more of lately, and I'm very excited about, are the movies, where we, we play along with a film. For example, later in January, we'll be playing along with Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And we get two or three rehearsals for that, and we'll do maybe two, sometimes three performances of that. And that, that can be very, very challenging because we have to sync up the music with the movie and that's a whole different skill set. But mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's usually we, we have about eight to nine services, a service being either a concert or rehearsal per week. And that yeah. can vary. So we can do as many as three different programs in, in one week if we have enough rehearsal time. And you're unionized, right? Like, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, everybody yeah, we, have, we have the rules that, that dictate that we can't be do more than that and i think i i mean obviously it's it's a good good thing because then we're not overworked mm -hmm. the thing is i i think many many of us you know we try to stay in good shape especially string players i know can probably play very for very long periods of time without needing to take a break i know i know of some of my friends who practice six hours a day that's that's something that i as a wind player would find very difficult to keep up just simply because of physical demands of the instrument and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I know, I know it would be possible. And there are people out there who do that and do that regularly. And I applaud them. And um, I certainly is something I, I continue to aspire to, but they're just the reality is that, that you really can only play for so long, uh, depending on the instrument. I find that I can play the bassoon certainly far longer than the contrabassoon. The contrabassoon is a very demanding instrument physically with the wind and the weight and everything of it. it it's, it's very demanding. So I have to really limit myself with, with that instrument. As much fun as I have playing it, <laughs> I just have to limit yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. it's repertoire-wise, right? Uh, there are yeah. four classical or, I don't know, for some romantic, early romantic, they don't orchestrate, you know, composers don't typically orchestrate contrabassoon. So does that mean you often uh, get a lot of break time? Like... Other musician play works more, and you just sit there, ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah, I I do I do feel pretty guilty about that. Um, but it, but I I try to I try to think of it as that this is this is my role in the team. If if I were if I were playing on a baseball team, and if I were say the relief pitcher, I'd spend most of my time sitting there. But then when it's my turn to do my job, I do my job, and mm -hmm. it's. I, I, I feel very fortunate that I play in such a good orchestra and that I get to be surrounded by such amazing musicians because when I'm sitting there, I get to be in the best seat in the house. It's really fantastic. I'm surrounded by amazing players. So pieces like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony where the contrabassoon doesn't come in until the last movement, I sit there and I get to enjoy one of the most amazing pieces ever written, played by one of the best orchestras in the world, mm -hmm. often. Yeah. And this happens with with many pieces. Many symphonies don't have contrabassoon playing in all the movements. Many of the tone poems and and later pieces that we play, I sit for a long time. Wow! But I I, I enjoy you, doing you, it. Um, yeah. Do you fall asleep? <laughs> I, I I I will say that I have been <laughs> relaxed enough so that I could not off. Mm. It's um, no, but it's 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 really it's really something because. Because when you're when you're in a very fine ensemble, there's nothing to wake you up in terms mm -hmm. of any jarring effect. But it is it is exciting. And mm -hmm. um, no, I, I usually try to make sure that I don't I don't nod off in the middle of a performance. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You guys sound so good. Um, I I used to actually a long time ago. I won't even nineteen you know ninety something. I actually won. Uh, I got into final of audition as a violist, and then I subbed a little bit. Yeah, um, I think that you guys sound so much better now. I think compared to the '90s, which you're not there yet. And 
and then I saw you uh, uh, in April and September, and then uh, you really sound awesome in Salzburg. Uh, uh, in you ended the whole festival mm -hmm. uh, of uh, what do you call Salzburg? Yeah art festival right yeah so the tell, salzburg the salzburg yeah. festival yeah. tell 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 us a little bit like um do you feel you play every concert just like that or do you really each concert slight different like when you play in the prestigious place also you sound so good in cologne that hall is so wonderful and you guys so tell us a little bit about experience like a different hall different festival do you guys you know have different energy well, it's it every every place has a different energy. I mean, I, that's a perfect word for it, I think, because you really can feel the intensity of it. And I I know that everyone everyone that I work with they played a very very high level. So it's never that it's intentionally better or intentionally not as good or intentionally this or that. But you do respond to the energy of the situation, and I I love that we are able to match that intensity. And to, in a sense, live up to the situation, to the demand of the situation, and to be able to to really hit one out of the park, so to speak, which mm -hmm. is what I think I think we did in Salzburg. You know, I think that was really really amazing. We had we had a few concerts before that. We had the the ability to spend a little bit of time in the hall and really feel what it was going to do. But we we knew, you know, it was a very very. Um, energetic evening people were coming in it was sold out it was very highly anticipated and um we had you know we were playing Mahler's first symphony we had Anna Sophie Mutter it was really just every all the all of the ingredients were there for it to, for something very special to happen and and it did it was really remarkable and um but I I mean really every concert we played was like that um there there were there were concerts where Every time we went to a to a different place, we were we had the opportunity to play to people who a lot of people who had heard us, a lot of people who hadn't heard us, but it was here, hear, hear us for the first time. And it was a great, great opportunity to do that. I, I, I remember years ago we had a, a campaign here at home mm -hmm. to try to to con not so much convince, but just it, you know, it I, I'm trying to find the word the right word, but let people know mm -hmm. that that when we go overseas, people really respond to how well we can play. And the, the name of the campaign was Hear Why the World Cheers. And so, you know, come and hear why the whole world, when we go to play, goes crazy over our performances. And um, it's, it, it happens. It really does. And it's, it's exciting to be a part of because I think, I don't know this for sure, but I think it's possible that some of the audiences really don't think of you know maybe don't think of pittsburgh as being one of the musical meccas of the world certainly cleveland certainly boston certainly new york certainly some of the very high-ranked european orchestras chicago yeah chicago i mean they they expect that they expect mm -hmm. that sort of thing they, they come and oh yeah this is going to be incredible and then pittsburgh is and then they're like oh my goodness this is incredible and it's it's becoming less and less so because we're we've been over there so many times i think people now have have expected that we're going to provide a really amazing performance, but it's it's still kind of the kind of thing where we're we're really I, I mean everyone digs in in this orchestra. It's really incredible. I, I look around when I don't play, <laughs> and I see everyone digging in, everyone giving 110 percent all of the time, and and that I, I I'm sad to say sometimes can be rare. I I. I I'm not going to single any orchestra out or any one out, but I have participated in ensembles where that's not always the case. So I find it even even this after all this many years, I find it really refreshing to be in an orchestra where everyone digs in. And I think the people who join the orchestra, for example, your son, I mean, he digs in. I love watching him. He gets so intense when he plays. <laughs> but I mean, he, he understands that that's what this orchestra does, you know, and he's he's willing and able to bring that. And I love it when when we have people that that do that, whether they're new members, whether they're substitutes, whether they're long term substitutes, whether yeah. they've been in the orchestra for years and decades, everyone digs in. I love it. I noticed I noticed um, uh, it, it's it's more uh, there's a soul, soul, how to say energy again. And they uh, you you guys looks like you really want to do well with the conductor like you the relationship 
looks very in sync and it's not like a, oh okay i'm just playing you know you can do your thing i do my thing <laughs> but it, there is so much ensemble wise uh, it's so in sync and it was very impressive yeah i i was very very impressed now in terms of audition right have you been on the um uh, audition committee before do you if you do do you do they assign you to a string audition or just a woodwind? No, we'll 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 do string auditions. I participated in in double bass auditions, and um, we have a we have what's called a core committee, uh, audition core committee, and members of that will serve sometimes on many committees. And mm -hmm. I used to be chairman of that committee. I was on that committee and chairman for three years, so I served on many different committees: uh, woodwind, brass. I have not yet served on a percussion committee just because it hasn't come around during during my time for me to serve on it. But we we used to hold and we still do hold regular substitute auditions for strings. And I participated in in several of those. And um, it was it was an interesting role because as as a member of the core committee, you're you are not only participating in the committee, you're offering feedback, you're voting, you're doing all that stuff, but you're overseeing to make sure the process is done properly and all that sort of thing. So you're serving sort of a double double role. I'm glad now that when I serve on a committee, I'm, I don't have to worry about that so much. But yeah, I've served on several non-woodwind committees. The most recent com committee I served on, I served on briefly for the base committee, but I served on our assistant principal librarian committee. Hmm. Wow. We, we had, yeah, our, our librarians are musicians in our CBA. So their audition process runs similar to a musician, we we spent a lot of time crafting the process so that it mimicked what a musician would, I, I should say, an instrumentalist would do when they took their audition. So that was that was an interesting an interesting process. But we we were able to hire a wonderful wonderful assistant librarian, and I'm very very happy that she's on board. So we're we're really it you, you have a lot of auditions. I I've been fortunate that I haven't had to take an audition in the last twenty years, but. <laughs> Before that, Lucky you. I, I, yeah, before that, I took several. Um, <laughs> Pittsburgh Symphony was actually number 40 for me. Oh, and my goodness. Yeah, oh, my yeah. goodness. Oh, so, I mean, that's I was, brutal. I was employed during that time. It wasn't like that was the first job I had. But as yeah. you pointed out, I've played in other orchestras. Yeah. But but what you do is is you you either decide, OK, this is where I'm going to stay. And that's fine. I mean, all the orchestras I played in were very good orchestras. There was really no you know, no reason uh, that I couldn't have stayed there, but I just kept thinking I, you know, maybe, maybe I'd like to move up the ladder, so to speak. But yeah, so, so the, I kept taking auditions when I was in these, these other orchestras and, and was, was happy, very happy, very honored to be hired by the Pittsburgh Symphony. But yeah, that was number 40 for me. That's crazy. So. <laughs> That's crazy. So um, my son is very lucky, huh? That was his first audition. <laughs> A lot, a lot of people do that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's a wind thing or a string thing. I, yeah. I think, I think a lot of, a lot of people think that, but really it's, it's, I mean, obviously he's, you know, very good, very, very prepared, very, has a very keen sense of what needs to, needs to happen in this orchestra, because that's the other thing I, there were, when I was taking auditions, sometimes I would do extremely well in some, some places like either, either get runner up or actually win the job. And then a little while later, I would get nowhere and mm -hmm. I'd feel like I played the same. I, yeah. I didn't feel like my, my performance was really any, any better, any worse, but mm -hmm. it's, it's really what the orchestra is looking for, what the best fit is. And so, that's so something that can yeah. be kind of intangible. So for people do not know uh, how this audition works, right? Like we have some people who are not necessarily musicians or uh, mm -hmm. no. So can you give us a very brief, uh, like, like, like a spiel of of how you know especially string i mean and probably the same string and bassoon yeah give, give it, us a I little it is. yeah 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 so so we're you know a, a job opening comes up you send in your app you send in your resume and you're you're accepted wait 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 wait, wait. long time ago i every month i check the musician's paper is it the same yeah. thing now same yeah. thing Oh. It's the same thing. Just it's it's the the information is disseminated electronically, but it still it still comes from the same place. 
Okay. And if, if the orchestra is not a member of the AF of M, then it, it's more of a kind of a media word of mouth, but mostly it's, it, it's the same thing. Yeah. I used to do that too, all the time. I, I get the paper every month, I'd open it up and I'd, I'd snip out all the bassoon auditions and, you know, send the resume. So, so you find out about the job, you send your resume and you are either invited or not, or whatever. Sometimes if you're not invited, you have to send a tape and if, if they invite you or not, but Let's say you get invited, you go and you play and almost exclusively the first round that you will play, what they call the preliminary round, will be behind a screen. So you're anonymous, you're given a number. And that's in basically that's in that's in the union bylaws. There's a certain, you know, it sort of evolved that way to do that. And then let's say you get advanced to the semifinal round. At that point, the screen can come down or it can stay up depending on the, the rule of whichever orchestra. Our orchestra, the screen can come down at that point. And then you play a semifinal round. And um, the rounds usually consist of a solo piece and orchestral excerpts like you were talking about. And the Rite of Spring, which I played, is on that for bassoon players. And then if you're lucky enough to get to the final round, you'll play a lot more solos and a lot more excerpts and you may be asked to come and play a week with the orchestra so they can see how you fit in. And at which point you're either given the job or you're, you're you know, thanked profusely for having taken the time to do the audition. But it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it, it can be a very, very rigorous process. Um, I, know that, I know that for me, I just tried to be, it was the same thing, I think, tried to have the same principle as getting, preparing a new piece of music. I just tried to be in, in as as good a shape as I could, the best bassoonist I could be. And then the solo, the solos and the excerpts was really an extension of that. Mm. And um, the other thing I loved about auditions was I got to see my buddies, you know, I got to, the same people would come and I'd get to see them and, and we would hang out and, you know, we'd, we'd all, we, we would either toast the winner or we would all, you know, toast our almost winning, <laughs> yeah. something like that. But that was, that was kind of a neat thing, you know, the, the audition circuit. I and remember having taken as, as many auditions as I did. I made quite a few friends that I, I still enjoy conversing with and hanging out with today. Um, it's 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 much it's it's really it, it almost feels like a the kind of bond that you might share if you're if you're in, you know, um, like a military situation or in war or something, because this is the closest thing that we have to battle, <laughs> mm. you know, is taking the audition. So we feel like we've shared those horror stories together, I suppose. And, and logistically, it's actually, it can be brutal because say people travel, right? They fly there to a different place, but they don't know if they can get into the next day, which is final often, right? The right. first round is one first round after you play, you have to wait, you know, and mm -hmm. Sean said he wait in the room with other people. Nobody talks. That, yeah. that wait for many, I know. many. It's, it's, it's true. Nobody says anything. It's you're, you're just totally silent and you're waiting for them to come in and, and, and announce they, which they come in, they come in, they say number 46, number whatever, right? Number five. They don't even say your name. And then everybody else just leaves. Oh my God. And then these people stay there and then you get into second round and then they give you a sheet of paper, right? Now you're going to play a slightly different repertoire. Sometimes you still play same solo. Right. So you play second round. Right. You wait again for many, mm -hmm. many hours. I remember Sean came back to the hotel and says, you know, I made into the second round. It was a long time. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so so people need to book their hotel, their fly, and that they don't know if they made it the second round. Right. So how do you right. deal with that? How do you <laughs> well, you 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 have to kind of make an educated guess. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think I always tried to go to an audition with the intention to win. So if, if they spread out the process over several days, I would go there hoping that I would be there for those several days and I would set aside the time, but sometimes that doesn't work. I know, I know there was, there was one audition I took, I think it was in St. Louis where I, I felt like I was pretty well prepared, but, but I, I, if I if I had assumed that I was going to say the second day, I would have missed a, a very important rehearsal in the job that I was in. And it would have meant I would have missed the whole week of work. And so what I did was I kind of jinxed myself by not giving myself that second day, which sounds kind of stupid. Like, why even go if you know you're not going to not going to do it? But it was just one of those, the, like you said, those logistical situations. And I ended up not playing well enough to advance. And so it, it worked out. It worked out 
just fine for that. But I, I always feel like you should plan to win. And mm -hmm. it's given me the opportunity to spend some time in a city that I would have not otherwise spent time in because mm -hmm. I, I'll book two or three nights in a hotel and then I don't make it past the first round. And then I have three days in this city and I could just hang around. And so that's happened a few times, or I've just come home early. It depends. Yeah. I used to have a range with my car. If it was within a thousand miles, I would drive. Oh, and if I it see. was longer than that, I would fly. And of course, contrabassoon auditions with you have the massive instrument with a case and having to check it and the flights and all of that sort of thing that provided logistical difficulties in itself. So you right. really have to you have to kind of figure out what what what's worth it. Um, the the week that I took the audition in in Pittsburgh, I actually took three aud different, different auditions that week. And so that was logistically very tricky. I took an audition in Indianapolis and the New York Philharmonic and then Pittsburgh. Mm. and I did I did well in all three but I did the best in Pittsburgh <laughs> that's wonderful that's yeah. wonderful so um now could you play a little bit for us because uh, well, we're well, we... almost uh at, at our uh, our end and yeah play something on Mipyang bassoon and then play something on counter bassoon so people can hear the differences so let's see any requests I know it's the holiday. Oh, that solo thing, Stravinsky. Uh, again? <laughs> yeah, but I don't think people heard. You play for me when when we were chatting earlier. Oh yeah, well I I played it earlier when you asked for it, but I can try it again. Oh okay, yeah. <laughs> It did the high the high register did not really uh it didn't of, come through yeah yeah that's that's weird <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. So interesting how huh? low doesn't penetrate. High also doesn't. High, high comes through too too much. Uh, All right. Now here's the here's the big instrument. Yeah. I'll see if anything comes through on this one. The the grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good that's good <laughs> did that come through yeah the last note yeah the last note came through yeah I love yeah it. yeah the note before it was a little muted <laughs> did that note come through <laughs> not uh, half 50 percent. half of it well that's that's our that's our probably our most famous note we play that note all the time in the orchestra that low oh. c yeah oh. it's a it's it's our bread and butter as a contrabassoon yeah. player yeah but yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's so, from the fifth, fifth Symphony of Beethoven. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Oh, I yeah. didn't even. I didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, we play I the know. we we play the bass line while everyone is playing the melody. The, the yeah. great joyous, you know. And we play the. We play that underneath. It's kind of wow. it's kind of neat. We we play all the counter lines to everything. It's very fun. And, and <laughs> he he was being Beethoven was being very uh what do you call forwardist actually like yeah like yeah he used the country bassoon right at the first yeah, time he, I think he was in... he he was the first to use it in a symphony. He used yeah. the country bassoon, piccolo, and trombones in the fifth symphony, and that was the first time that had ever been done. Yeah. And so he was he was very revolutionary in many ways. Yeah. Right. And and thanks to him and thanks to other composers like Brahms, Strauss, Stravinsky, uh -huh. Shostakovich, mm -hmm. Mahler, mm -hmm. we have some extraordinary contrabassoon parts. And of course, Maurice Ravel wrote the very, very nicest solos for us. They're they're yeah. the ones that are on all of the contrabassoon auditions. Can you play that? <laughs> yeah, that that I played that the before the 
Oh, the, Ravel. the Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Oh, okay. <laughs> that 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 went through. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The last then, note actually was louder. Yeah. The yeah. last note was loudest. Yeah. So I know we we don't have much time, but I wanted to. I was talking about the the other other big oboe instrument. Yeah. And that's this one here. The uh, it's called oh. a hecklephone. Yeah. Starts... You you said uh, I met you again in Wiesbaden, uh, in yeah. Germany. That's the city they make this thing. Yes, right? exactly. They make these in in the Heckel factory, which is in the Biebrich, which is a, a, a little suburb of Wiesbaden, but that's where these instruments are made. So it sounds it sounds like a little a little like an oboe. Mm. <laughs> Very nice. Is so it's a different read from bassoon or same? A little bit. It's kind of like a bassoon read. Oh, okay. But it's but it's scraped a little bit differently and it fits it fits differently on the end of the, the vocal. So in the in what situation the a repertoire composer would say I need a hacker phone, whatever you call that. There there um very rarely there's a there's a the most famous, I suppose you'd say, piece that uses a heckle phone is the Alpen Symphony, the Alpine Symphony of Richard uh -huh. Strauss. Oh, okay. He also uses it in his operas Electra and Salome. I see. And Hindemith wrote wow. a trio for hecklephone, viola, and piano. And I'm hoping wow. Sean will get to play it one day. Wow. And um, that's what I was playing earlier. It starts off. <laughs> So that that's the main melody of that. But oh, it, nice. Hindemith wrote for everything. So he wrote for Hecklephone. And wow. at the premiere, which which took place at the Heckle factory, uh -huh. where the instrument was made, Hindemith himself played the viola part. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. very, very cool. Very, very cool thing. Well, so what so, city do you know what city Hindemith uh, was born? Like, oh, God, I should no. know this. Do you, do you know this? <laughs> Google. No, I don't. I just know he's a German. Yeah. 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 He, he, he was, um, I mean, he, you know, he composed a lot of amazing music very quickly. And, and he was one of those that had to emigrate to America because the Nazis considered his music to be degenerate. So he was forced to flee. Mm -hmm. And he ended up teaching in the States and lived here and then conducted everywhere all over after World War II. And he was able to travel again. But he wrote for this instrument. He really liked like this instrument he wrote he wrote that that trio for it and it's a very good piece i i was lucky enough to play it not that long ago down in florida and yeah um, i was supposed to play it for post-concert chamber music at the pso in april of 2020 but mm. of course covid derailed that so mm. yeah um, i'm hoping to play it again at some point and and if sean is up for it it's as you would think it's quite a difficult viola part but it's not as extensive as the other pieces because he features the piano then the heckle phone and then the viola comes in so it's yeah. it's hard but it's not sustainable hard not like some of his other pieces yeah so. and uh viola world uh considered uh, paul hindemith as uh, a pioneer uh because uh before that there was there was not that much viola you know 20th century music or late 19th century so he wrote so many either concerto one concerto sonatas uh solo oh, yeah. and then sonatas oh, with it's, the piano it's really so really tremendous many I many I, the, I don't know if you can see this but i i love this album my teacher right kim cash no <laughs> is it yeah this yeah, yeah it is yeah i have that yeah, too. Is, oh yeah i love the whole I love this. Hulk it. yeah she's awesome yeah. She's I awesome. love that recording. Yeah, yeah I love yeah. listening to it. It's very inspirational. If you, if you check out my YouTube channel, right? Just my YouTube channel is the Jewel Media. Hey, by the way, uh, if you were, are listening or watching later, please consider subscribe this uh, channel so you can type in Kim Kashkashan interview. So I did very early, two years ago, March of 2020. She was my victim. <laughs> That's incredible. I, 
I interviewed speaking, her. Speaking of speaking of victims, didn't you tell me that this was what what number of podcast is this for you? You're what, what, what number two you two hundred oh six. So special song for the two oh six. I'll let, I'll let you guys Google that. It's very, it's, it's sort of a riddle. It's the, yeah. it's sort of an esoteric riddle to figure out the number two of six, if you can figure out what that was. Wow, that's nice. It's, it's actually not that tricky to figure out. But. Is it D major? <laughs> D, is yes, it D major. D major. Exactly. <laughs> so my my friend, uh, Shark Finn, is asking a uh, question. Does James teach bassoon and or overall music? His experience and uh, breadth of knowledge are impressive. Seems like a natural teacher. I can see that. You well, teach you. in many different institutes, right? Yeah, I, I, I currently teach at Duquesne University. I'm one of the adjunct professors there. I also coach the Three Rivers Young People's Orchestra, the Wind Ensemble, and also the, the Young People's Orchestra. And I teach privately at home. I've taught for many years. I, I've, I've enjoyed having wonderful students. And, and as I mentioned before, I come from a family of educators. So it's something that I'm very passionate about, very um you know, I love I love doing it. I love working with young musicians and and trying to I love sitting in the orchestra and playing with them. I love just, you know, interacting and telling my stories and listening to their stories. It's it's something that that's been very, very dear to me for for a long time. And every everywhere I've been, I've been lucky enough to have students either at, through a university or a college or just privately. And it's been it's been a great blessing to be able to have that kind of experience and to have that be part of part of my musical life so i and i love i love trying to bring things together to be part of the educational experience for for me having knowing a piece's history is very important knowing why scales are important why arpeggios are important all the fundamentals because how they can apply to the music and that sort of thing that i love being able to tie things together i think that might be the scientist in me having come from having such a scientific background there's a there's a great beauty in the analysis but then applying that to the to the the musical situation is always very rewarding that's wonderful that's wonderful yeah teaching also makes us um, learning somebody said the best way to learn something is to teach yeah. and, and also yeah and also i think it, it's important the student gets inspiration from you you know and seeing you play on stage i think it's very important right for your students Oh some, yeah, yeah. I, some teachers do not perform, you know, and that's some true. Teacher do, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I love it. I love it when, when the students come to the, to the concerts, and I get to talk to them. I get to meet their parents, and just kind of really tie it all together. But yeah, that, that can be a big part of it because then, then you really get to demonstrate what, what it, what it's about, like what the goal is. I know, I know. One thing I like to try to do all the time is have fun when I play, to enjoy what I'm doing. Because we work so hard, we spend so many years practicing and preparing and building strengths in our abilities and fundamentals. And I think that that the performances and the rehearsals and really just playing for me, that's the payoff. That's the that's the reason why we do all of this is so mm -hmm. we can enjoy it. And and it it's it would be a shame if we couldn't enjoy it. Right. So I, I I know it's I know it may sound you know somewhat like hey have fun you know and. And it's like, well, how can I have fun? I'm focusing so much. It's like, well, you know, you've already done that. Once you get to the stage and it's time to perform, you've already done the work. You can't practice anymore. You can't sit and make another read. It's time to play. So why not have fun? And right. I, I, right. Just, I just think I think that that may sound that may sound a little bit, you know, I don't know what it sounds like, but I, I it's, it, it may <laughs> sound cliche, but I, it's, it's, I just I just remember Every time I go on stage and play a concert, I remember that first concert that I played mm. and how much I enjoyed it and how much I thought, wow, this is really what I want to do. Right. That was 42 years ago, and I'm still Gee. loving it. Wow. You know? Wow. You're <laughs> only uh, 43. Um, uh, I also wanted to tell people before we wrap up is that uh, because a lot of people do not know what uh, so-called professional orchestra, right? And you are considered a 52-week orchestra, right? 
Because mm -hmm. I used to play with orchestras like, a, you know, 39 weeks, meaning we yeah. only get paid 39 weeks. And so, and then interestingly, and people do not know, uh, most of them do not know, you have nine weeks paid vacation. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> That's it's, sickening. It's, <laughs> well, it, it, I, I, I suppose, I suppose you could, you could say that except what, what what I what I try to think of, and this this isn't my own, my own idea. This is something that that has been pointed out to me, is that we we're an orchestra. We're we're one of the best orchestras in the world, and so if you compare us to say a professional sports team like the Steelers or something like that, um, we really are, you know, we're very good, and not not to sound like we you know want to toot our own horn or anything, but I think we we deserve to be able to be paid enough to be able to only have to worry about making art, about making music, creating art. And I think, I think that's, that's important. And, and I don't, you know, I've, I've been there, I've played in orchestras that, um, you know, one orchestra I played in was 32 weeks <laughs> for the year. And, you know, we, we were, we had to, had to figure out what we were going to do the rest of the time. And it's wonderful. It was a wonderful orchestra. I had a, I had a terrific time playing. I was there, there for a number of years. But I think I think really that's kind of one of the perks of being in an orchestra like this. It's what attracts people to want to be in an orchestra like this is what maintains the standard. And it's what allows us to be as good as we are because it attracts the best, you know, and then we can we can stay the best. I think I think once once that and, and the, the idea of a 52 week orchestra really is it means that you've you've made it to the big time. You've made it to the top. Mm -hmm. And so you you really can feel like like this is this is who I am. This is what I do. It's something you can be enormously proud of and something that you can you can really justify the maintaining of your abilities at that level. It's, right. It's really it's some it's something that's that's just it's very special. And yeah. there really are only a hand when you think of it, there are only a handful of organizations that are like that. Mm -hmm. So I feel enormously proud to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I mean, there. If, if you think of like the top ten orchestras in the country, you know, there's ten contrabassoon players in the top ten mm -hmm. orchestras. So right. I'm one of ten people who right. have that distinction. Right. Right. Um, right. And then you know, one of one of a thousand people who, you know, can 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 say that and you know in, in that kind of class of a woodwind section, and then one of ten thousand people in the whole country. You're Charles Barkley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So uh before we wrap up, do you would you like to play a very quick game with me? I play that, that with all with my uh my guest. It's called Rapid Fire. And Rapid I Fire? Ask, yeah, I, I ask a question and you have to answer really quick. No, no, no long speak. Yeah, as quick, you know, as short. Okay. Yeah, it's all it's kind of silly, but I'll yeah, try not to curse, okay. Fun. <laughs> yeah, try not to curse. No curse. Uh, <laughs> okay, so ready. Uh, favorite color? Oh, I'm sorry. Purple. What is your favorite color? <laughs> purple. Okay, purple. Uh, what is your favorite uh, Chinese dish? Oh my gosh, what what is what, what is it called? Uh, it's the mushu pork. <laughs> <laughs> Real American. Uh, uh, okay, so um, which book you read recently you would recommend other people to read? That I would recommend? I just yeah. read a book called The Survival Paradox, and it talks all about bio biochemistry and biologically why we as a species have survived. I would I would recommend it heartily because he, he delves very deeply into a lot of really interesting topics. It's by a man named... Um, what is his first name? Dr. Elias. Isaac Elias. Yeah, very good book. I think it's fantastic. Great. Um, at home, do you cook or your wife cook? My wife cooks. <laughs> and what is your favorite genre of food? Say, say she says, let's go out to eat. What's in your uh, first choice? Well, we, we there's this, this um, Asian place we like to go to. It's called uh, Typhoon. And um, there's also a, uh, a a place called Ariza. They make kind of these these um, build your own bowls, but they're Asian derived. Um, yeah, I guess I guess um, Asian food is my definitely my favorite genre. 
Um, do you exercise? What do you do? I, I go for walks and I recently acquired an elliptical. So I've been What's trying that? to use that. Uh, it's it's like a it's kind of like a cardio machine. You you simulate running only you don't you're not on a on a treadmill. You're you're turning you're turning your feet in an elliptical fashion, which doesn't doesn't require that you actually pound anything. It's be, it's better for the joints and it's better for your back. And I unfortunately don't have a very good back, so I, I the elliptical helps a lot. That's great. Now uh, you have traveled many many countries, uh, particularly with the orchestra. Do do you have one city uh, you will if you had a half half year of doing nothing? Which city would you like to like hang out there? It it does it have to be different than no I my my wife and I we love we love um, Washington D.C. I think we would really love to spend a lot of time there if we could because it it it's very it it kind of opens up to all different places too. So what about foreign would, country? I would I've always wanted to go to Iceland. I've always wanted to go to Reykjavik. So. I think I would love it um, there. I, I'm, I'm not sure about half uh, like an extended trip because I don't I don't know what the the change of seasons are like. <laughs> but I do yeah. I, I I do in, I do enjoy you know going overseas. Um, there there are lots of cities that that have been very appealing. Uh, other than COVID time, does uh, uh, Pittsburgh Symphony uh, tour uh, to Europe? Or other countries uh, every year. We go about every other year. Uh, it's it it depends. Like like we would we would do a festival tour one year and maybe do a just a general tour another year. But before and after COVID, we've been kind of going about every other year. Do you come to New York City every year? Uh, yeah, we well the city not not as often as we used to, but we travel to New York pretty often to visit my wife's mom. No, no, I mean orchestra perform. Oh, at the, the orchestra. I'm sorry. Carnegie. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we 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 were there last in in May of 2019. We played it. Was it called Geffen Hall now? Avery Fisher Hall. Jeff, <laughs> we played. Ma oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We played yeah. Mahler Fifth Symphony there, That's and it's awesome. been a while since we've been to Carnegie Hall. So yeah. I'd love to go back again because the it's it's wonderful playing there. So when you're not teaching, when you're not performing, what 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 do you do for fun? Well. I like I like to read. I I do like to make reads. I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, it's That's still, work. It's still, well, I know it is, but I enjoy it so much that, uh -huh. that it's it's really a um, I, I and I love to learn. I love to learn about new pieces of music. I love to learn about you know new new literature. Um, I mean, it's it's really I just I enjoy I enjoy learning. I enjoy ex get you know gaining new experiences. Um, I'm always on the lookout for another piece of music. And I love that my job more or less requires me to do that. You know, it's it, it's justifiable that I can spend a whole day studying the works of Rachmaninoff, you know, uh -huh. because it, it, it we're going to be doing his third symphony soon. So I get to learn about that. I get to learn about his life. I get to learn about what made that piece special to him and what led up to it. And so I get to study all of that. That's yeah. that's wonderful for me. I mean, it, it wouldn't if I didn't do all of that, I it. I would still be able to play it and I'd still be able to play it well. But what makes it really exciting for me is to learn all of those things about it because it, these, these were people, mm -hmm. these were people who had lives and who, who had ups and downs and had extraordinary things and very mundane things just like we did. And so it's kind of neat to see what it was about them that made them do what they did. So learning, learning about them and their, their lives and their situations makes it, um, enjoyable sometimes it can be horrifying for certain mm -hmm. composers who had to, who had to compose under extremely trying conditions that that can be a horrible thing but then that you 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 see then the triumph of the music that came out despite that or you see why this piece was so incredibly terrifying mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah 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 so uh uh, maybe two more questions. Um, <laughs> I, right now it's uh, six o'clock Eastern time. If I would take you to a, a a place to have a drink, what's your choice? To have a drink? Yeah. Well, I there's there's a there's a nice coffee shop right up right up the street from um, from Heinz Hall called Rock and Joe. I'd love to get a cup of tea there. <laughs> oh yeah. 
<laughs> okay tea great tea i love tea all right so uh any do you watch any of the te uh, you know popular television series which one do you watch we're big fans of Grey's anatomy oh okay <laughs> yeah. that's an old one right that's old no one. it's still on oh okay, okay. yeah no, we, we, we like the older episodes and the newer episodes, but we've been okay. we've been watching that that show a lot, kind of trying to play catch up with, um you know, the, the, the older episodes. Oh, I didn't even know. So that's a, a major network. It's not like a Netflix thing. It's right. It's like NBC. Right. Yeah, it's it's on it's on TV. I think it's ABC. Yeah. ABC. OK. OK. Yeah. Well, um, great. I want to thank you for being my guest and you're so much fun and so inspiring. And do you have last word for us? Oh, Just... sorry. I want to thank our audience to be with us. Thank you so much. And Shark Finn and many uh, tech tech for your uh, Lewis and many other people. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. So, so last word, Jim. Just thank you so much for this opportunity and, and for being able to tell you about what, has inspired me so much over over the years and and what continues to inspire me and what continues to make what I do very special to me and I hope very special to a lot of people. I I think music really brings us together in a very unique way and I'm happy to play a very unique instrument and a uniquer instrument and a uniquest instrument <laughs> and to, <laughs> to be able to have to have had the opportunity Google to do this would for like so many that. years. <laughs> Google, Google and, could not liking your, you know, contrapersonist. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, uh thanks. Oh, well, Sherry Grant just, hey, you're late, girl. <laughs> Sherry <laughs> Grant is from New Zealand. She's a pianist. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for being uh, my guest and check out every, pretty much every Wednesday. Uh, I do a show and next Wednesday I ask uh, my son. So I'm going to interview Sean and uh, yeah. So, but he, he's not too crazy about uh, <laughs> appear in the public, but we'll <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. And it's, and it's a special thing for me because next, uh, next Wednesday is my birthday. So I oh. said, yeah. So, so humor me, you know? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Jim's uh, bio and my bio is on, under uh, the description. You can uh, check. And also uh, there's two links. One is the Pittsburgh Symphony has a website and you can check, you know, Jim out and you can check a lot of musicians and you can see their programs. Yeah. And then there's another link, which is uh, Jim has a Facebook page. And so, yeah. And uh, I am a filmmaker, actually. So if you have nothing better to do in a cold day, uh, watch my uh, latest work called My Young Gun Diary. It's on Tubi TV. Tubi is a free streaming platform. So you can watch, but you have to be concentrated. You know, it's 90 minute documentary. So yeah, <laughs> bring your popcorn. All right. So you want to play something before we end? This is, this is for you for next week. Oh my goodness. <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you jim say hello to sue for me and uh I will. yeah yeah so we're gonna end our podcast and thank everybody and uh see 